Hello and welcome back to the Talking Leadership TV podcast series. Thank you for joining us today. Our guest is Cliff Beach. He is a musician and author and has been performing live for more than 20 years. His single, Confident, was featured on the Spotify All Funked Up and Funk Drive playlist with over 875,000 streams. He is the host of the Deeper Grooves podcast and Deeper Grooves on 885 FM. He is the author of Side Hustle and Flow, which chronicles his musical journey while still working a day job. He has written previously for Beauty Tap, Pepperdine and Rockstar Life. He is the winner of the John Lennon Songwriting Contest Grand Prize, two World Songwriting Awards, four Global Music Awards, a California Music Video and Film Award, and has been nominated for four LA Music Awards, one Hollywood Music and Media Award, and an Independent Music Award, amongst many others. His music has been recently featured on the CW, HBO Max, and in a BMW spot. I know you'll enjoy this podcast today. Cliff gives a amazing overview into understanding your why, and we make that connection between understanding that and what makes for good leadership. I know you'll enjoy today's podcast, but enough from me. I'll hand over to Cliff. Cliff, thanks for joining us today on the podcast, my friend. We are um, recording this for those that are either watching or listening, I'm in Brisbane in Queensland and you are in LA, correct? That's right. And it's it's the day before, so it's midday your time and it's uh, 5.30 odd in the morning here. So I wouldn't usually do this, but I am a morning person and I wanted to have this conversation with you. So thank you for joining me. Um, lots of questions, Cliff. And so the, the my podcasting is around leadership. So in that context, as someone who is in the music industry is in multiple industries and to me reading your bio and what you do you have a very strong entrepreneurial bent but i won't label it i'll, I'll let you do that if i if i've made a mistake here what motivated you what motivated you sorry to write your to write your book side hustle and flow and why was that important to you Matt? thank you so much uh, for that question so originally I started working on writing a book in 2014 and the book was then titled The Art of Awesome. And I wanted to go around and interview people who I thought were awesome. And if you look at the last chapter of my book, Side Hustle and Flow, we put some of the interviews from that time in there where we talked with Zig Ziglar's son, Tom Ziglar, about Zig Ziglar and just how he was a thought leader for many years in the space of sales and beyond. And then I also met with Jen Lim, who worked with Tony uh, say and uh, and Zappos and their delivering happiness project really my first foray into understanding like how people study happiness globally around the world and America you know obviously does not fall in the highest in the happiness scale in a lot of western places but um but some cool things along the way and so the art of awesome I was around 30 at the time and I thought after four interviews of telling people I was a writer that I suffered from imposter syndrome as a musician, I didn't feel confident to say I was really a writer and author. So I shelved the book for years. And then in 2020, when music stopped, uh, March of 2020 during the pandemic, and people were now flooding online, including myself, to do music online, I did about five concerts, which miraculously got picked up by CNN. And I got to speak on behalf of all musicians on what music was happening in 2020, only to then decide this is not for me. I didn't like doing Instagram or Facebook Live. I did about 10 altogether uh, during the pandemic. But uh, I was like, you know, I need another project. And what's the best thing that I can work on? I was like, let's pick up this book because that's a very solitary process to do alone. Um, and so I, I took a course. There were a lot of free courses during that time. It's like, hey, we're all stuck at home go uh, read a book, learn something. So I took a course by Scribe Media. Uh, there's a guy, Tucker Max, who's a New York bestselling author. I think he wrote a book called, uh, I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell. Uh, they did really well and they made a movie too. Um, and so he helps people like Tiffany Haddish and David Coggins ghostwrite their books. Uh, and then he also helps people that, you know, for free, essentially can take a course and learn how to write their own book. So that's what I decided to do. I said, I'm, I don't want to pay for a ghostwriter. I'm going to write my own story. And so then at the time I had called the book From Fool to Fulfilled. I was trying to figure out again, why are some people's lives like really fulfilling and other people's lives just, you know, there's busyness and then there's being about your business and they are different. And so you can fill your life and stack it with a bunch of stuff. And at the end of the day, it may not move the needle for you because 
you haven't learned how to set up time management or goal setting or anything like that, or really just know what you want to do. And so ultimately, as I kept working on the book and thinking about my life, I figured out that I had stumbled upon this formula of side hustling before I really knew what that meant. And, uh, and so then I took from the MTV movie, uh, Hustle and Flow, the title Side Hustle and Flow, because I learned now as I got older, I'm 40 now, that uh, the flow is important. And so I've been studying uh, Qigong and, and, and Tai Chi and, and yoga and things like that. And so the breathing and the flow, like that's how you, you get through it, but then that's also like how you put the system together. And so for me, side hustling was, oh, I work full time, which I'm vice president of digital and operations for a growing, a growing beauty firm online. And then uh, I work full time in music from all different avenues of radio, television, uh, podcasting and performing live writing producing recording so it, it just was I embodied something that I then encapsulated into the book but at the time I didn't really know what it was and then later I realized that I talked to more people about the idea and uh, and shared the book with people people like it really resonated with them like they go, oh okay because there's a, a thought leader in a in an online kind of um uh, motivational speaker who wrote books, Gary Vaynerchuk, or goes by Gary V. And he basically said, uh, I don't have to be the smartest in the room, but no one will out hustle me. And that's what I realized I had developed where it was like this constant grind of project to project to the next thing, you know, saying yes to many opportunities. That's how I ended up on television on Discovery Channel because someone's like, hey, do you want to be a band on the show? I said, sure. Did I know how to do it? I did not. But I said, we'll figure it out. And, and so I've learned through that process that the journey is uh, really the, the enjoyment and the fulfillment wrapped in there. And there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just kind of putting baby steps one step at a time. Yeah, but that's, um, that's an amazing context uh, scene setting, Cliff. I have more questions than I know what to do with here, but well, I'll go with some observations. So sounds like you're quite an introspective fellow, in that you're thinking about what's going on and why it's important for you. And that to me resonates in the leaders that I've spoken to. And I think in my travels, and I might get your perspective on this, when you meet the people you've met, do you get that sense that um, in the art, in that artistic space, if we can go there, that the the most effective, the best people that operate in that space actually think about their practice and what they're doing before they do it either consciously setting out some time or they'll blurt out what they want to do to the world and get feedback from the people that they know and love in that in that space does that resonate for you cliff it definitely does you know as i interviewed john hope bryant i worked for many years volunteering for his financial literacy program operation hope in los angeles and he basically said that your life may be the only Bible that people read, you know, that people are watching you and learning from you. And Tony Robbins, who I've been a huge uh, fan of for many years, says success leaves clues. And he he learned a lot from Jim Rohn. So finding mentors and, and listening to people and learning from them. I actually heard it said this way where you don't have the lifespan to make all the mistakes. You have to go talk to someone who's already done it and made those mistakes because you just don't have the time and it, or the money. It's just not worth you know doing it. And that's really the true life hack. But yeah, in terms of speaking to people, I've learned so much from every person that I've had an opportunity to to, to, to speak with and to, to interview or even to read their books. I had my book uh, bought by Hal Elrod, who I had read his book, the miracle morning and so i had learned all these things about starting the day uh an hour before uh work or anything else for yourself um self-care but more on the mindfulness space doing meditations doing visualizations doing affirmations things that i used to think years ago were very la very new age um but i i have adopted you know things in there because it's you can't take for granted that uh Something simple like focusing on your breath that you that you do that. I actually learned from my acupuncturist that when they feel my pulse, they were like, you have such a high level of stress that you stop and start breathing all the time. You're like not breathing <laughs> like that because you're just like that intense. So I had to be uh, come to that awareness at the same time. 
I had taken a masterclass online from masterclass.com from uh, Herbie Hancock, who I love, amazing jazz musician. And, you know, at 80 plus, he still runs on stage, which I think is amazing. I was like, I can't run on stage now at 40. So when I'm reading this, uh, uh, watching the video course that they did, he was so heavily um, influenced by Buddhism. Uh, and so he was like, you focus so much on the doing, the playing, the actual mechanics of everything that sometimes you forget the being. And he was like, I focus on just the being now. So it's like, when I think of like what I want to do and operate from, because productivity wise, I, I focused 40 years on the doing and I accelerated my entire life. So I went through uh, all my you know grade school by 16. I went to conservatory at Berkeley at 16, graduated college at 19 with my bachelor's degree and, and then just kept it moving forward. So everything was always like fast paced, fast paced. We must be faster 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 and so now i'm starting to think even in the last 10 years i had a plan where i was like i'm gonna make 10 albums and i did from 2013 to 2022 we released 10 different releases some live albums some studio all kinds of stuff collaborations projects ended up having a song confident that has almost a million streams now that we did independently and and i've learned so much within the the, the process and so i just think that for me, I was very introspective or became that person introspective, which is funny because people think because you're performing and you're very extroverted. I don't think of myself as a full extrovert. I think of myself as an omnivert. I'm just as much introverted. I can have be alone as I can uh, you know, be around people. But I feel like you can learn from everywhere. I was just talking to a saxophonist, a girl who's kind of growing up and she saw me perform and she was asking me about improvisation. And I was explaining to her that as a musician, I sing and play keyboards, but I learn from all different styles of music other than my own. And I learn from other players. Like I learn and emulate what I hear from a saxophonist or a trumpet player or a drummer because people are like, well, how did you make that sound interesting? It's like just taking it and translating it to a totally different instrument sounds novel even though i really didn't create anything and and there's many artists who have done this like ella fitzgerald way before me um who horn players said you know if you played horn you you take all our jobs because your improvisation is so good so i think uh i think just be a lifelong learner be open that you're you're never going to be able to know everything and uh the only way to really receive is to have an open hand, you know? If you have a closed fist, then you can't receive anything. So you have to be open to be able to receive this knowledge because the knowledge is out there and people are telling you things that you need to hear. But if you are so focused on other things or not paying attention or don't have that mindfulness of awareness then you miss a lot of life lessons and those can be anywhere. I think Zig Ziglar said, uh, you can find a good biscuit in a garbage can. Like, I mean, at some point, it, it, good information can come from anywhere. So you just have to be watching and again, have that open hand or open mind to be uh, able to receive the knowledge around you. Yeah. What well, words of wisdom that um, it's a nice way of, of, of pushing that agenda around lifelong learning that you can learn something from anyone you meet. And that it sounds to me that the, the projects that you do, you're learning something from all the time. And before we started recording, I, I said the same thing that, uh, my podcasting is my passion project and I learn something from every everyone that I speak with now in this leadership space for what this is worth. I may not always agree with the perspective that my guests take or vice versa. They may not agree with me, but it makes for an interesting conversation because we don't necessarily have to agree. But I think I take away something from every conversation. It sounds like you have as well. What What I will note here, something that's very important that – you said your life seemed a bit rushed or you planned it that way. And this this notion of, of having a work-life balance, it came to you a bit later. And um, it's it's annoying that um, particularly men, and I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at our, our gender here, that until somebody says, hey, you've got some health issue you need to be aware of, or hey, you might not be breathing properly, or it feels like you're a little stressed, until somebody else makes you aware of it, it's something that may not be conscious in the mind. And the fact that you've got to that point is uh, very a very good outcome for yourself, but it's a good lesson to share with other people or, or uh, those um, young young men and women that are coming up in the ranks to learn something from you because, yeah, you're not, you don't have enough time in a lifetime to learn 
all of the lessons. So um, if you if you can take a more pragmatic look at the world and learn from somebody else, there's nothing wrong necessarily with that because you can't experience everything everyone else has. It just it's just not going to happen. And, and those that think you can are either slightly deluded or don't really get um, the end game on this is that things come to an end and you're never going to have enough time to do everything that you might want. Um, you, you, and you're wearing hustle as your shirt there and, and you talk about a side hustle in a big way. I, but in, 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 in preparing for this conversation, uh, someone spoke to me about how they set up their world of work and they talk about having a portfolio career. I think that's what we're talking about when you're talking about side hustle, that what are the other projects in your life that are going on? And um, sorry, I'm using a, a wanky business term, but it, it is what it is. And that's how I, I tried to get my head around when you mean a side hustle. And when you talk about that, because I, 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 I'm more to my detriment, I haven't read your book yet, but I will uh, get it and have a read. When you're talking about a side hustle, is it always necessarily to make an income or is it about a project that might help you get to an end point that isn't necessarily about making money? Yeah, that's a great question. And we, we do cover that in the book. So in the beginning of the book, I talk about I was in a kind of job seeking group and I met a guy in there and he said uh, he really enjoyed salsa dancing. And I said, well, if you know what you really love to do, then you should do that as much as humanly possible. And as much as you can afford to do, even if you're just putting on YouTube and salsa dancing at home alone, it's uh, it's something that makes you happy. And they've learned that. We learned that uh, on the island of Japan, they have a word called ikigai, which basically means reason for living. And that's why they have attributed that they have the most octogenarians, people who have lived over 100 of anywhere in the world. Uh, because people, they're like, you know, if you know what you should do. You should do that. That's when you look at someone like a Tony Bennett and they're still doing it at 95 plus. You find usually that when they stop doing it, they they usually decay or die pretty quickly after that. And they had that years ago when people would retire, that they would retire and they had nothing else to to live for. They they would pass away. Even with hospice, we've learned uh, in old folks' homes, uh, in old age homes, that if you give someone even a simple task of uh, watering a plant daily, like just to know they're waking up to do something every day that something is depending on them, keeps them alive exponentially longer than people who don't have even such a simple task as that. So I think we do take for granted. Unfortunately, we don't live in a society that necessarily pushes us to do what we love to do. Or they're thinking about, well, I have to always make money. Um, but ultimately there are some things that will make you money. And there's something that you just do because they're they're fun or relaxing or enjoyable. And that's what the balance really is when you think about a work-life balance. The thing is that when you think about work-life balance in hospice, they study people, nobody says, uh, I wish I worked more, you know, at the end of their life. Or no one says, you know, bring me, bring me my work product so I can see that one last time. It doesn't come up. Uh, they wanna, you know, they remember the people uh, that mattered the most and uh, you know no one's like bring me all my things i want to bring my car by so i can see it one last time it doesn't come up and so um but it's sad because you don't want to get to the end of your life to finally realize you know that other things mattered more i tell people this analogy all the time of wizard of oz is that you watch that movie or read the book and at the end it's like you don't need a wizard you don't need a magic person to tell you anything you had everything inside you this whole time you had the shoes to get back home you had the courage you had the heart you had the brains you had it all that time now this person is just making you aware of what you already had and so i think people owe it to themselves like there's people like me who i always knew i loved music and wanted to do it and so that's great there's some people at 40 they still have no idea what their purpose is and what their passion is, but they owe it to themselves to find that. And by by asking yourself self-reflection questions, which every chapter of the book has, and they can be different questions. I never tell anybody, do what I do and you'll have the same outcomes. I don't think that works. At the same time, you could answer these questions or ask other questions because I don't ever say these are the right questions to ask. You have to ask questions to figure out from the answers what's right. You don't know 
at the time. It's very scientific method, but that's how it is. It's like you have this hypothesis. You don't know if it's true or not until you've actually run the experiment. And you have to run thousands of experiments sometimes. Like Thomas Edison had 10,000 experiments to get to the working light bulb. And I tell people all the time, and he learned from the other 23 inventors who did 10,000 experiments. So at the end of the day, they had 230,000 experiments to be able to figure out now this light bulb that we use as a, a marvel and, and the Wright brothers making the airplane, all these things that people thought was impossible became possible by people who dared to dream. But I think school, for sure, we know from Sir Ken Robinson's TED Talk that school beats out of us anything creative or interesting. It's just we're, we have this pack mentality and like in our the back of our brain, our ancestors, you know, we don't want to get kicked out of the herd. You know, we need to to fit in. So everybody's always trying to to fit in. But the people that you remember really are those outliers, you know, the because all growth happens outside the comfort zone. So like a ship is safest when it's sitting at the harbor, but it's meant to sail. But if you sail, sometimes it's gonna be rough. There's gonna be rough waters and things you can't imagine you know unfortunately like the titanic and now this submarine that has sunk near the titanic i think there's just some bad juju over there people should leave that place alone but i i think you owe it to yourself to ask the self-reflecting questions i think we're just not pushed to 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 ask ourselves these questions and again when you study happiness we're not no no one's ever saying you know what makes you happy or what makes you tick or how can we rally around you to help you you know, succeed in your goals and, and, and dreams. It's almost like you're afraid to dream at this point because you're like, what if I fail or what if I look foolish or whatever? But you, it's like the only process. Like you're you're going to probably be bad. Like I'm taking golf lessons right now. I've never done golf before and you're terrible. Like you have to just know it's new and you have to give yourself grace that you're not that good at it. But Jim Rohn said, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. You got at, at least, at least you could admit it. I, I, sorry. I laughed out loud on that one. The, um, it's funny when you're trying something new and you know, you suck at the start that there's that point where you go, I'm never going to get good at this. And I look, I have a lot of respect for people that play golf, but I, don't rate it as a sport. It does nothing for me, but I understand how difficult it is because I've tried to hit a golf ball and after about 50 attempts, I was like, I'm never doing this shit ever again. Uh, I would rather fail at something else. But um, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense what you're talking about, asking those questions and what the education system does to people. I would I would counter though that when you're young and we're in that pack herd mentality and we're um, teachers are trying to get information into us. The system is what it is because it's probably the best we know how to do at this point. And um, I, I would, I would also suggest that uh, some teachers really do try and keep that creative spark in you going, but they can only do what they can do. And um, this, the education system is what it is. And it, it's funny that when we get to the ages that we are, you said you're in your forties. I'm. I'm pushing 50 myself. You can look back and make these observations, but when you're in it, it's all you can do. Like there's, there's nothing else. There's no other option other than potentially being homeschool. And that was never going to be an option for myself. And I don't know what your circumstances were, but I, I had to be at school like everybody else. I, I, I really like this idea that you can you know lay any, any number of introspective type questions, but if they're not the ones that suit you, then find what your question is. And I think that's what you're getting at here. You need to find out what is your why. And I would, I would suggest Cliff that that is quite um, ego shattering for some people, because if you set your life up to do X and then you get to 30, 40, 50 and you go, Oh shit, maybe that wasn't what X was. Maybe it's something else. It can be quite disturbing for some people. And, and the people that don't ask that question, don't ask it for a reason. I think the ones that are consciously aware of it, won't ask the why because they don't want to know the answer. Um, and you've, you've probably met people in that uh, boat. I, I have as well. I often look back at um, particularly my father, who I I, um, I love dearly, that he lived a life for his, his whole family. And now that he's retired, when I see him doing what he does and I don't understand it, I think, yeah, maybe his why was in there somewhere. He's doing what makes him happy now and if I don't get it that's okay too because um your why doesn't have to make sense to anyone else but yourself 
And I, I think that uh, translates in some ways into how you practice leadership that um, people don't necessarily don't necessarily have to understand your process, but it's what you put in that uh, that gumbo that people will ask about. So if you're not people focused, if you're not focused around others, then you're doing something, but maybe it's not leadership. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, definitely. Leadership is interesting because I heard the story of George Washington and our uh, civil, war, no, before the civil war, our revolutionary war, uh, where it's amazing that he was able to to gather people to to join the army because when you, in layman's terms, explain the proposition, you're going to people and you're saying, look, I can't pay you. I need you to fight. And if we lose, they're going to kill us all. Like, like that, that's, that's really the proposition. But if we win, then, then we'll be free. You know. And again, when you tell people something like that, the only way you can do it is because they tapped into a very compelling why. That's why when you look at someone when you're like, how do they persevere? I just went to see the Tina Turner musical and she just passed away. And when you see her story, you're like, oh my gosh, this person was beat on daily for 16 years by their husband, who they really, you know, may or may not have loved at all, really, but they were appreciative of that this person helped them when they needed help and where they came from. And now to have this amazing comeback at, at 44 as a woman, who women in Hollywood, you know, they're not allowed to age, right? So it's like to have this comeback, to go through a ton of racism and other stuff and, and just persevere i mean literally like this person i i mean she should have quit so much you know and and to see like wow i mean not only did she persevere but like she got through the other side and became even bigger than she had ever been at 44 having her first only number one hit song after decades of being on the circuit and having many songs that you know and so uh, that's about the compelling why. That the way you can have what Angela Duckworth calls true grit is what I tell people: true perseverance is not the first mile; it's the second mile. It's when the feeling to continue has gone a long time ago, and you're a crazy person to continue. That's the person that you're going to see succeed, because anybody can do it when it's easy. It's when it's difficult and it's difficult a very long time, which they used to have a word for perseverance and the Bible called long suffering. That's really what it is. It's like you really have to pay the sacrifice daily and it is a sacrifice. That's why when you look at the world, if it was easy, then everyone would be rich and everyone would be skinny. Like that's what the world would become. And we know that's not true. So you have to say, I have to have grit and grit is a, a character development, it's a muscle and it can only be activated from resistance, from adversity. And so the trials and tribulations that being, you know, beat up, bludgeoned by a circumstance, as Maya Angelou says, or daring to be great, as Brene Brown says, that person that's bloody in the ring, that's the person who wins the prize. It's not about winning, it's that they got out there. And the Rocky, you know, you see that, like, why are you still fighting? You look terrible someone threw the towel in his face <laughs> right. and 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 stallone was rocky that's the beauty of that story it's like he sold his dog at a liquor store for 50 bucks you know wrote the script told them after an insane amount of money i won't sell it to you unless i'm in it i am that underdog i have embodied that that's what side hustle and flow was for me i didn't write a book to just write a book i wrote a book to condense it is me I am that person who had to side hustle and flow and figure it out. And I wish that someone had taught me how to put a life together. And there was a class in school, Life 101. And I could have not had to go through all the bumps to do that. So I'm like, well, learn from me and learn from all the thought leaders I've heard from. But yeah, I think when people think, oh, I have this dream, that's like, you know, one of many steps. The dream is the easy part. The action behind that, that's the tough part. And then the delays and the disappointments and the difficulties, those other words, yeah, they come up. They come up and it's like, now I have to have a very strong passion, purpose, ikigai, why to be able to go, okay, this, I'll, I'll go into that battle with you, George. <laughs> and that's, you know, with a bleak <laughs> understanding. So. Yeah. You, you put that very eloquently. I was just um, running through my mind. You got to go through some shit to get some shit, I guess, as uh, as time goes on. And mm -hmm. yeah, learning from others is important um, in in lots of ways. When you mentioned 
think you mentioned before about mentoring and who who you have around you that is a good way to test some of these things so you can avoid some of the disappointments but again if we go back to how do we get educated on on planning your life that life 101 that no one you can't set up that class because it would be um that would be an impossibility but maybe someone can prove me wrong that you have to have some failure and you have to have some um some roadblocks to learn because if it's a hassle-free journey if i can use that terminology you you'll get there but you haven't learned a lot in the process and when the big hit does come down the track it could destabilize what you're doing so i i, I would think again this is just an opinion those that, that have, have have achieved those levels of success that you're talking about but not necessarily in the public eye that they probably had a lot of tumbles before they got to where uh, they got to before they they tasted what success looked like um cliff let me ask you um in the book and again, I, I really should have read the book before we spoke, but that's that's on me. You talk about the myth of motivation. Can you share what that is with us in in a hundred words or less? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. So I talk about it, but I really learned it from Mel Robbins. So I love to give credit. But yeah, the myth of motivation simply is um, like as a musician, there's a lot of people are like, well, I have to, I have to drink, or I have to smoke, or I have to be in this mood to write or to perform. And that's just not true. Like you look at someone like a Diane Warren, who's wrote like so many top songs. She just day in and day out, eight to five at the piano. Some songs are great. Some songs are okay. But it's like the diligence and the discipline and the consistency is what gets you there. We already know that talent is like 10% of the equation. It's that again, Gary Vee, no one without hustle me. It's the person working while you're sleeping. That's the person that's going to get ahead. And that process, you know, showing up every day. Sometimes you get an opportunity just because you showed up and nobody else did. And so the showing up daily for yourself, for your dream, for your purpose, uh, you can't wait again for that feeling to always be there. Because feelings, you know, it can be perception. It can be a mental thing. It's like you watch a movie and you think it's happening, but it's not really happening, but you have those body responses. So that already tells you that feelings can be wrong. You have to sometimes bypass feelings and just say hey this is the work that needs to be done the muse is here great the muse isn't here the work still needs to get done yeah 100 percent. i um am a comedy tragic and i do watch a lot of youtube and the um those that are that some would argue are the top of their field in comedy your, your Chappelle's, um your bill burrs and all of those big name comics, but even those that aren't at that level. And um, I'm a big fan of Andrew Schultz. And when these comedians talk about their process, when you get them in interviews or they're talking and they let their guard down and it's not having the funny line, but they talk about their craft, it's about the hours and the bullshit that goes into the process of developing a premise and working on that and refining it and testing it and having audiences maybe not so much gel with it, um, they talk about exactly what you're talking about. And I, as a as a normal human being, not in the artistic space by any stretch, think about getting in front of an audience and it going wrong or just getting no reaction from the audience would just be the, the deer in the headlights moment. I I don't think I'd ever go out in public again. So there, there's, um, there is a process there and I think – those that in the the artistic realm again not not my area of expertise but i think when you see them getting it right it, it there was so much process before getting to that point that you have to think about what is it about that process that gets you there and so the the talent is a percentage but it's that work in the background that nobody gets to see that is the difference between great and awesome and then um legendary down the track and I've, I've i've learned that through listening to um comedians but um i i try to look for and i, I get your opinion on this look for people when they have those moments of clarity when they're talking on youtube or writing books like yourself that that's where you get those inspiration points not necessarily that you're going to get up at a at a ted talk or some public thing and give everyone those nuggets of gold i think you've got to keep searching for them does that that resonate with you, Cliff? 
No, definitely, definitely. I think for me, I'm always trying to become better than who I was yesterday, but I don't measure myself to other people because I mean, there's always someone who's younger, hotter, faster, stronger. I, you know, yeah, that's just a, a losing sliding scale. But, uh, but I know that nobody can be me, but everybody has their X factor. That's, you know, everyone, that's snowflake. Everyone has that unique DNA. And uh, why the people that are able to tap into their passion and their purpose and through trial and error, figure it out. The more you really become your true self, I think the more people can gravitate to you. And I can see it not only in uh, the, the music and the output, but I can see it in, in my, my, my branding and, and what I wear and everything as it transitioned over time. I really started to figure out, okay, that's, that's me. This is, this is how I want to present myself. To the world, but from the comedy world, which I've done a little bit in, um, it's definitely harder, I think, than music. But it's true; you have to be able to develop that stomach and the thick skin, and and go through really this rejection therapy. That you have to be comfortable with people not liking you, not liking what you have to say, or uh, or stepping on toes or offending people, and that's part of the process. So when you look at someone, you're like, oh, this Netflix special or Seeing them live was amazing. It's like, yeah, but in Tulsa, Oklahoma, they they died. Like so many deaths out there, you know, like they go to places that maybe not everybody sees, but it happens. There's no, there's no way to succeed where you haven't failed. Uh, but people like failure isn't fatal, but failure is supposed to fail forward, you know, and to fail fast <laughs> so that you learn. Again, there are always these learning nuggets and learning opportunities. And so I put out many songs before having this one that now has a million streams. The other ones were also good, <laughs> but it just could be timing. It's what I learned. It's how we positioned it on Spotify playlist. I became better. And Jim Brown says it the best where he said, life will never become easier. You just have to become better. That is the only equation and the only solution. Like all you can do is be better. You can't change the situation. 99% of life you have no control over. And so you have to accept that. I tell people all the time from a therapy standpoint or just in general, the past is something you can only accept. You can't go back unless you have a DeLorean and change the past. So you have to accept whatever happened has happened. And I have no control over what happened. And I can't go back and change anything that happened. All I can do is from a reflection standpoint, look back and say, what do I need to learn? Am I repeating any patterns and things like that? You know, you look at, I come from Christianity, the Bible, uh, you know, why would it say God had six days to create and then a day to rest? I mean, he's God. He doesn't need to rest. He doesn't get tired, right? He wanted to model the only way to look back and say what I did was good is to rest and to reflect in the same way. I don't sleep well and other stuff like that. But when you sleep, when you rest, that's how the body repairs itself. That's how you stay healthier. That's how you have more stamina to work. That's why when you're on an airplane, they say, put your mask on first before you help your children or someone else. Because if you become incapacitated, you now are a liability to all of us. And so people think sometimes that it's selfish, but it's actually selfless. Self-care is a necessity. It's a must because like the Good Samaritan, the only way he can come down the road and help you is because he had done the work to have the money to be able to guarantee what you needed. And that's the thing. It's like people want to help, but they don't have capacity. Lisa Nichols says, you can't give from your cup. You must always remain full. You must have abundance overflowing into your saucer. You give from your saucer, but you never give from your cup. You always stay full. And part of that fullness is having that purpose and the passion, but then again, also having that self-care, the awareness that you must take care of yourself first, even before your kids or your spouse or your parents or whoever. You matter. You are a person. Because sometimes with codependency or other stuff, when I mentor people, I learn some people really struggle with self-love, with self-care, and knowing I need to think about myself. That's why I love how Elrod's Moyoka Morning. It's like I wake up and do something for myself, not for work, not for my passion, not for my, just me just for my body, my mental health, before I do anything else. And the reason why you do it in the morning is because it sets the tone for the rest of the day.
Cliff, that is uh, amazing words of wisdom there. And it um, it goes back to the theme of this whole conversation, my friend, is around understanding yourself before you can understand others. And that is a lifelong process and you're never going to always get it right. But I think the fun is in at least trying. Um, that's, that's the sense of what I got from that. Look, before we go, Cliff, one final question. I tend to ask this in my uh, the more formal leadership podcast because we've, we've talked on a lot of really, really good topics here, but I want to distill this down um, to you and your experiences. So if you had the chance to get in that DeLorean or go to a younger version of yourself, what would you say to a younger version of Cliff about um, being a more effective artist, human being into the future? What would you say to yourself? I would say to my younger self, don't care what anybody else says or thinks about you. Because when I was a kid, I was bullied in school. People said, you talk too much or you're weird or you're always singing. And the crazy thing is that it shifted as an adult that everything that made me interesting as a musician is that. That I do go talk in front of people. That I do perform in front of people. I do sing quite often all the time. And uh, and so it's interesting. Everything that I was made fun of for eventually became things that were strengths and things that people lauded and applauded. But I think ultimately, you know, they're saying to say like, you, you know, you're the captain of your own ship and the master of your own fate. I learned when I got kicked off American Idol very quickly to pivot that, uh, that nobody is gonna tell me what I can and can't do. And I'm not gonna wait for someone to green light my dream or see my vision. That's why I created my own record label to put my own music out there. Cause I was like, hey, if you don't want me, then, then I'll, I'll do my own thing. That's what Jay-Z did, nobody wanted him. And so then he built out his own billion dollar empire. So I think there's people that are learning this that we live in countries that allow us to to become businesses and to sell services and to make money on ideas. And you have people like Airbnb, who are a couple of guys with the air mattress on their floor making you breakfast because they heard that the conference was full. You know, it's like 50 bucks. You can come stay here and I'll tell you the best places to go. Now that's a billion dollar app. And you look at someone like Amazon, who's like, okay, we're going to enter books, very unsexy, and have warehouses and ship you stuff. It's like, okay, fine. But it's like they kept, you know, building into the infrastructure and then eventually like taking over everything for, for better or worse. But it's, it's important that, that you learn that it, there's going to be somebody saying something and that's okay. One, they're talking about you. So any press is good press, but more importantly, it doesn't matter because they don't make statues to critics. They make statues to mavericks and game changers and people who dare to be different and dare to be weird. And good music and good artists and good people will always prevail. And so you just have to say, it doesn't matter what you think. It only matters what I think. And again, I have everything inside me that I need. If I get it from the outside world, great. But again, it's the intrinsic that matters. And that's why self-care is so important to keep that positive loop because the world has so many negative forces from the outside coming. Uh, you really do have to guard your mind, guard your heart, guard your your feelings. You have to guard who you tell certain things to, you know? Some people are crabs in a bucket that pull you down. So it's like, you know, you're gonna, you ask 10 people 10 different questions and get 10 different opinions. At the end of the day, you have to know and listen and be quiet to that inner voice inside you. You know, Lisa Rankin, an amazing doctor was sick for a long time and she wrote this book and she had this theory that basically was like, you can write the prescription for your own life. You don't need a doctor to tell you that. I didn't need my acupuncturist to say I wasn't breathing. I knew that I wasn't breathing because I knew that I was prolonging a level of stress that just was unsustainable. And it's like, you can know that. If you're working a job that's just not working, no one's holding a gun to your head, like let it go. You know, but so it's like, again, when you quiet yourself and have that self-reflection time, you can ask yourself and check in, you know, with your body and your mind, your spirit, and like what's what's working, what isn't working, and what's working today may not work 10 years from now. It's like, as you notice, your body is changing. And it's like, you know, I used to be able to eat a whole ring of Oreos. Now I can't even look at Oreos. So it's like life changes, but the ultimate thing, younger self, 
don't listen to anybody else. Just do what you think is best. And right or wrong, you know, you made your choices, but you'll be happier because not everybody's going to understand who you are, like, because it's it's coming from inside you. Nobody can actually know the real you. But at the same time, have that vulnerability to be able to, to have that core group of people to be real with, because they're going to keep you honest, especially if you're trying to do entertainment or something where there's just so many, all kinds of people, you really do need to have like someone outside of that circle that's like your true, you know, the people that you can lean on, good, bad, you know, because there's a lot of fair weather friends and fair weather people, but yeah, just... You know, you can take it with a grain of salt what people tell you. Please thank you for your time, Cliff. Thank you and for having me. I love the everybody you've talked to and what you're doing and keep up the great work. And if this is relaxing for you, then I say it's your acre guy, man. Do it as much oh, as you can. Oh yeah, yeah. This, this is the best professional development you can I, I couldn't pay enough to do uh to afford to do what I'm doing here. And this is um this is a way that I learn because um I'm um, I'm a um a curious fellow at the best of times and I like asking people questions and the gold that you get from conversations around what you can do to adjust your thinking is um is critically important for someone like me. And if I can share what I'm doing with other people, I say, look, go and listen to these interesting human beings because they've got something to say. And um I think if we did a little less talking and a lot more listening, you get a lot more learning out of that process. And, um, yeah, look, I uh, live your life as a uh, glass half full and I think, um, you'll, you'll be okay going forward. So Cliff, thank you very much, mate. Thank you, Eric. I hope to talk again soon. Take care. That concludes our podcast. Thanks again for joining us. But more importantly, I'd like to thank Cliff for sharing his views. I really enjoyed this podcast and having a discussion that took me back to understanding why it's important to, well, understanding your why. More content to come. Our next podcast will drop on the 18th of September and will feature a discussion I had with Marla Alberti, who is the owner and founder of Truth Speaks Group, LLC a multimedia company that creates strategies and solutions for work life, integration and harmony. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day, rest of your week and we'll catch everyone on the next episode of Talking Leadership TV.